Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll hear a musical performance by Elisa Corinne. And uh, but first, our guest is director of radio for Prairie Public Broadcasting, Bill Thomas. And Bill, thanks for joining us. Sure. Uh, as we get started, of course, you know we're talking about the 50th anniversary of Prairie Public, and even though uh, radio is not necessarily 50 years old, that's okay. But it's it's a big part of what Prairie Public's all about. Uh, but for, as we get started, tell the folks a little bit about yourself and your background. Well, uh, I grew up in southern Illinois on the Mississippi River, right where the Missouri runs into it. Uh, and I uh, got involved in radio in college at my little college radio station and got very interested in it and started out uh, volunteering at non-commercial radio stations. That was the kind that interested me. I, I liked all kinds of things around the radio, but got involved there and ended up working in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, and Washington, D.C., and Los Angeles, California, and Lincoln, Nebraska, and North Dakota. So uh, that's, uh, I, I've been working on radio just, you know, pretty much my working life. Well, as I just mentioned, yeah, the radio division is not 50 years old, but uh, to tell the folks a little bit about the history of, of the radio side of Prairie Public. Well, uh, when Prairie Public was going across the state and building out as a public television network, there were people who had traveled to other parts of the country and they'd heard public radio. Uh, they'd heard uh, radio in, in Fargo and Grand Forks as well, people from Bismarck. And they were really interested in the idea of bringing radio to the central part of the state. Uh, there was public radio in, in the Red River Valley from the universities. And so, uh, they started working, they organized a group, they lobbied the legislature to give funding, and they approached Prairie Public as being an idea for the place, you know, that could be a home for building a western part of the public radio network in North Dakota. And they succeeded and finally did get a station on the air in Bismarck, KCND in Bismarck, went on the air in 1981. The very first voice on the air was Dave Thompson, who is still the first one on in the morning. Uh, and I think the first thing he said was, here we are and are we glad. Uh, and Prairie Public continued with the idea of trying to reach all of North Dakota uh, and areas of surrounding states and provinces with the radio signal. And so uh, pushed to add stations in Minot and Jamestown and Devil's Lake and Williston and Dickinson uh, and, and did. And uh, that was something that people liked the idea that the, the public service broadcasting could be available to anyone in the state. Well, Bill, you know, early days of programming uh, on, on uh, Prairie Public, on the radio side, lots of classical music, or what, what 1981, well, what do we have? Uh, yeah, the, you know, the, there was definitely a, a classical music contingent that were strong lobbyers for the radio station and uh, still, you know, really support the classical music that's on in the western part of the state. And so that was on the air. Also, uh, the... Uh, news magazines from, well, all things considered, from National Public Radio. Uh, but from the very first, you know, there were other things on the air, jazz and folk music and, and uh, specialized programs on the weekends and things. Those, uh, those were a part of it uh, from the beginning at Prairie Public. You know, I know there's been various incarnations of, of the name. I, guess I think it may have started off as Prairie Public Radio. Right. Uh, it then evolved into North Dakota Public Radio. We'll talk more about that probably uh, later. And, and then uh, to the brand of just Prairie Public. Can you talk about the, the evolution well, of Yeah, that? you know, they sort of represent different stages because when it was Prairie Public Radio, that was the Western radio stations, uh, Bismarck, Jamestown, Minot, Williston, Dickinson, that uh, were licensed to Prairie Public and operated in the western part of the state. And then we did develop a partnership with the university stations in the eastern part of the state. And, and that became North Dakota Public Radio to kind of distinguish it that it was this partnership. Uh, and after we had operated that way for a few years, we realized and we talked with our university partners and they were all right with it that you know, it was a little confusing to people actually because Prairie Public was the operating partner and was in, you know, the, it was all in the same building, under the same management. And we said, how about if we just call it Prairie Public? And uh, our university partners were fine with that. And so we went back to that as, as kind of a way of indicating how the whole thing goes together. 
Well, with that said, let's. Uh, can you talk about the history of KDSU and Fargo, and then KUND and KFJM in Grand Forks? Yeah, well, they have interesting histories. They go way back. Uh, KFJM uh, in Grand Forks can make a pretty good claim to be the first radio station in the United States. Uh, a historian at the University of Wisconsin who looked into it thought thought they had a pretty strong claim for that. Uh, after World War I, there were all these young guys who'd been in the service who'd learned about wireless and radio, and, and they came back and they wanted to experiment with it. And of course, they congregated around colleges and universities. And in the Midwest, it was especially important. And so in Fargo, in Grand Forks, there were people playing around with the idea. And um, at, in, it, it developed a little differently in the two places. In Grand Forks, uh, they went ahead and put an AM station on the air, KFJM, uh, got an early license in the early days of licensing for radio stations, and started off with a limited broadcast schedule. Uh, they had to go off the air a little bit during World War II, I think. At one point, there was a fire that put them off the air, but mostly they were on continuously. Uh, and then they added an FM station, KUND, uh, much later, uh, and even then a third FM station uh, after that and became Northern Lights Public Radio and uh, you know, had a long history up there. Uh, KDSU also started with some AM broadcast and then they, they had the idea, let's partner with a commercial station and they partnered with WDAY in, in Fargo uh, to do university broadcast on WDAY. And at NDSU, they really saw it as part of the land grant mission, you know, the outreach mission that the universities had that uh, they really jumped on radio as a way to extend the knowledge out to the public, which is part of the whole mission of, the, of NDSU and the land grant schools. And um, after a while, they put on a low power station in Fargo, uh, and then the school got big enough, the low power station couldn't even cover all of the campus, and they eventually put an FM station on the air in 1966, I think, uh, and that was KDSU. Uh, that that went on and, and uh, continued to operate and grow, and a lot of a lot of NDSU students were trained there and, and learned about broadcasting. Yeah, so a lot of deep, rich history for those mm -hmm. uh, two organizations. But then, uh, somewhere along the way, and when was it? Uh, we came into a partnership with Prairie Public. Uh, University of North Dakota and North Dakota State University. Right. Yeah, now I wasn't here for that part of the story, but what I've heard is that in the 90s, uh, for different reasons, Prairie Public and NDSU and UND were all kind of looking for ways to sort of change how they were doing their public radio. Uh, and there were different problems that people had or changes in how they went. And of course, all around us, states uh, to the south and the east of us and in Nebraska and in this region, uh, Wisconsin, as well as Minnesota and South Dakota, we see state networks. And the idea had kicked around for a long time. Oh, maybe we should like go together and do some kind of a state network like these other states do. Well, in the 90s, people were looking at, you know, maybe this could be a lot more efficient. We're a low population state. We're trying to cover the whole state. Maybe we should go together. And so the Corporation for Public Broadcasting from Washington, they're in favor of more efficiency. Uh, they help sponsor discussions and meetings among the three parties, UND, NDSU, and Prairie Public. And they worked out what at the time was a very cutting edge agreement where uh, in the past, if something like this was going on, the licenses would all just go to one entity and they would become the operator. And what we decided to do here was to do a partnership instead of just some people giving up their stations. So NDSU is still the licensee of KDSU in Fargo, and the stations in Grand Forks are still licensed to University of North Dakota. Prairie Public has the licensee of the Western stations, but they're all operated as one network that's called Prairie Public, but it's a partnership of the three entities. So that, that was a new thing, and, and uh, for a while we had a lot of other states calling us up and asking how we did it, and now that's become an arrangement that uh, has become sort of a standard part of the operating repertoire in public radio. Yeah. Well, now, so what is the coverage area? Because I know that even after the partnership, uh, there was sort of a, a hole up in the, the middle part of the state. With yeah. Some, some yeah, coverage. we added the station in Devil's Lake, uh, and that uh, that took care of that, and we had some gaps out west, so we put on a higher power station in Williston. Uh, and, you know, you can never have perfect, complete coverage if somebody is way down in a valley or something like that, but we pretty much 
you can say that we cover all of the state of North Dakota. There's some gaps here and there, but but small. And, uh, and surrounding states, we go into Northwest Minnesota in a big way, into uh, Eastern Montana, uh, go over into Canada a little bit, a little bit into South Dakota, and uh, we, have, we have good coverage. Okay. Well, let's talk about the news division and then the sort of the rock solid presence of Dave Thompson. You said he first voice heard in 1981 on, on Prairie Public. Yeah, and he's been news director since 1981. And, uh, you know, sometimes when somebody's in one job for a really long time, they can get in a rut and just do the same things all the time. For Dave, the way it has worked is this is the kind of job, being a news director at a statewide network, this has just worked out so well because over the time that he's been in this position and he works in Bismarck, the state capital, he has accumulated and his memory works wonderfully well. He has accumulated this storehouse of knowledge about state policy, state history, state legislation. If, if I'm on the air with him and uh, I bring up some idea that somebody is bringing up in the legislature or at an agency or some nonprofit somewhere, or some company is doing something. You know, Dave can always pull out the con. He'll say, yeah, well, you know, back, back in 1978, uh, this idea first came up and he'll tell you the whole story. And, you know, he makes it interesting. And, and what he can do because he has all this knowledge is he can take these things that a lot of times are really kind of abstract state policy things that sort of can go right by and make your eyes glaze over, and he can really make you understand them. He can put it in a story and a context where you can understand what it means, and that's, that's a great gift. And he's also just widely acknowledged as a very fair news person and interviewer who is not out to get the gotcha moment with somebody or make somebody look bad or somebody look good. He wants to find the information and get it out to the people. And he's really respected on all sides in Bismarck for that. Okay. Bill, how, how are you funded? Well, uh, the biggest funding comes from voluntary contributions from our area uh, between the members and different uh, nonprofit organizations and businesses that do sponsorships. That makes up about half the funding of uh, the radio part of Prairie Public. And the biggest part of that is the membership. Uh, we have um, members from every county in the state. We have people from out of state. Uh, and our membership support has grown steadily over the years. And it's you know at a very high level. We're, we're at a kind of a peak right now, but we hope that we'll go on to, to higher peaks as more and more people find out what it is and support it. So membership, sponsorships from businesses and organizations. Then we do receive about 15 percent, that's one five percent of our funding comes from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, it's the federal funding. Uh, we get funding from the state of North Dakota, uh, and we get some cash support, some financial support from the University of North Dakota, and then we get grants and, uh, you know, have various other other uh, sorts of funding that, that help keep us going as well. Okay. Well, for most people that, that watch uh, and listen to Prairie Public, they heard of membership drives. Can you talk yeah. about the membership drives and sort of how they've evolved over the years? Yeah, well, they have changed a lot uh, as we've learned more about how people react to them. One of the things we've learned is people really notice the membership drives. And so we've done our best to actually reduce them, and we have. We used to run three full length and one part length, and full length meant a couple of weeks. Uh, membership drives, and we would be on the air from early in the morning straight through every 15, 20 minutes. We'd be in there pitching hard to people to be members all the way till late at night. And we've really changed that a lot. We've cut way, way back on the amount of time that we spend on the air asking people for money. Uh, we have two drives that are like a week and a day long, like eight days long. Uh, and we have one that's just uh, four days long, Wednesday through Saturday, the short and sweet drive with chocolate. Uh, and we limit the amount of time that we spend talking when we are on the air. We keep ourselves tight so that we don't go and ramble on for a long time like we used to do. Uh, and uh, we've limited the number of hours in which we're on the air asking for support. So uh, we've cut back hugely in the amount of time. And by doing that in a smart way, 
and being really efficient about how we talk about it on the air and by the fact that so many people have now switched to becoming sustaining members where they're just signed up on an ongoing basis, we've really been able to reduce the amount of time that we're on the air asking for money and yet still have our membership grow. So we're happy about that. Okay. Well, let's turn to sort of a national scene and talk about the importance of NPR, National mm -hmm. Public Radio, the anchor shows with Morning Edition and All Things Considered. Right. Those are the biggest draws for public radio in general and certainly for us. That's what we see. It's what more people listen to. Um, those shows have, you know, those have become so well respected. Uh, they are uh, sometimes described by, I've heard them described by people, for instance, at ABC and other media outlets as the gold standard uh, for journalism. Uh, the, the, uh, they've been honored many times for their balance and, and in-depth reporting. Uh, the, the terms that, that often come up about them is that they're in-depth and intelligent reporting on a whole range of issues. The first, the first national public radio show was All Things Considered, and it gives you an idea. They didn't want to just focus on the hard news. They didn't want it to be all, you know, politics and wars and, and strikes and that kind of thing. Uh, so they've always included arts and music and books and food and just all kinds of stories about many, many things that uh, in those days you wouldn't have expected to hear on a newscast. And so it wasn't really a newscast. That's why they call them magazine shows. And uh, they, they really help people, I think, understand a lot about what's going on in the world. People appreciate that and listen to them. Hmm. When did NPR begin? Well, uh, they began in 1970. Uh, the uh, Public Broadcasting Act was passed in 1967. Uh, that put some federal, that's the beginning of the federal funding, and that put some more resources. There had been public radio stations around, uh, quite a few of them, for a long time. Uh, but this put some more funding into it, and some of the stations got together shortly after that happened and said, you know, we could really use a national organization. So 90 stations joined together in forming this national public radio. It was uh, not, not formed, it, some people think it's like a federal agency or something. It, it was formed by the stations. Uh, and uh, many then other stations joined it. And uh, the first broadcast of All Things Considered, which was the first daily show, was in 1971. So uh, it's been going strong and growing ever since then and is, is doing pretty well right now. Bill, what do you tell people though when they, they, they sometimes come out and say, NPR or public radio programming has a liberal slant? Well, uh, that's always, a, a, in one way it's real easy to talk about. Every kind of study from every kind of person that's looked at the reporting on public radio has always found that it's been very balanced, that it does a very good job of showing different sides, that uh, all the different kind of ways that people try to look for bias in terms of looking at the topics covered, looking at the kind of guests you have on, you have you know, grad students uh, writing their thesis who are going through analyzing all the words in the newscast and everything. And it, it always comes up, and, and by the public, it comes up always rated as very fair and very balanced and, and a good, good source of news. And uh, even people who sometimes are the ones who are talking to me about they feel it's a liberal bias still tell me they listen a lot because they feel it's such a good sort of uh, source for news. Um, you know, the thing about bias or a slant or whatever, it just depends so much on you and where you're coming from and, and how you look at things. Uh, and what to one person uh, is slanted one way to another person might appear to be slanted another way depending on, on where they're looking at it from. So uh, all I can say is, you know, everybody who's really tried to look at it in kind of a hard facts kind of way, it comes up very balanced. We have, when we look at our listenership, and we look at the number of people who identify as conservatives and the number of people who identify as liberals, they are about split the same in our listenership. And when you ask people what they think uh, of, of it, most of the people who listen to it think it's um, you know, good, fair coverage, good information. Well, Bill, in this uh, day and age and uh, with the digital technology, uh, some people may say radio is not important as it once was. Uh, 
What, what's your response to yeah, that? Yeah, well, the delivery is changing. Uh, and uh, we've switched our transmitters to uh, hybrid digital transmissions. They still transmit the old analog signals, but now they're transmitting digital as well. So if you've got a digital receiver, you can pick it up that way. Uh, we're streaming over the internet and more and more people are using things that way. People are taking pieces of the programs on demand. I think something that will call radio in the sense of it's mostly audio, something you can listen to in the car, something you can listen to while you're cooking in the kitchen, something you can listen to while you're getting ready in the morning or going to sleep at night, that's going to be there. How it's going to be delivered, well, that's the predictions seem to change every six months, uh, but it, it certainly is changing. So what do you hear from listeners when you're out in the public? <laughs> uh, uh, they say uh, they either love or hate Dave Thompson's puns in the morning. Uh, they, you know, the biggest thing I hear, the, the phrase I've heard more than any other is window on the world. People really appreciate, whether it's in music or more often, you know, in news and information, they feel like public radio gives them a view out, a wide ranging view. It's not narrow just on one thing of, of what's going on out there. And uh, that's, that's what I hear more than anything else. That public, I appreciate public radio. It's my window on the world. So, Bill, what is your best part about working uh, for Prairie Public and providing that service? You know, the Prairie Public organization, people working here are really oriented toward this as a service. You don't find people here who are coming in to just put in their hours and collect the paycheck or, or just like, oh, I want to make more money or something. Uh, it's it's a service, and, and, and people have that mentality. Of, we want to provide a good service, and, and that's the best part of it. Yeah. We're running out of time, Bill. If people want to find out more, where can they go? Info at prairiepublic.org, prairiepublic.org on the web. I'd be glad to talk to them on the phone or write with them on email. Bill, thanks for joining us today. Stay tuned for more. Singer-songwriter Elisa Corrin of New York Mills, Minnesota writes songs about unusual characters and obscure events in Minnesota history. One song focuses on Dorothy Moulter, a courageous and independent woman who lived on Knife Lake near Ely, Minnesota. Dorothy owned a resort in the Boundary Waters region and her legacy grew from the warm hospitality and ice-cold glasses of homemade root beer she provided for tourists. Today, a museum is dedicated to her life and her passion for root beer. In the boundary waters in northern Minnesota, I live the life I want and I wouldn't change it one iota. Lived here most of my life here on a lake, a lake called that I live in, mostly happy, mostly alone. I'm a strong, strong woman in my wilderness home, and I'm all about root beer, root beer, root beer. Winter freezes the lake to ice I got the ice from the lake with a knife Stack the ice in the ice house And huge ice melts Each cube weighs over 100 pounds Cover the ice with sawdust I cover the sawdust with moss People come and help me But I'm the boss of my root beer Root beer Root beer Root beer I carry hundreds of glass bottles over hundreds of miles of trail. I wash hundreds of root beer bottles in Knife Lake with a brush and pail. I draw gallons of lake water to pour in vats of root beer mix. I pour root beer in root beer bottles for canoeists on their summer kicks. I sell them root beer, root beer, root beer.
Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funding for Minnesota Legacy Programs are provided by a grant from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public. <laughs>